Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. Well, I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Uh, our, our episode today is entitled, Don't Forget About Vicksburg. Um, many of our listeners, especially American history buffs, will know that that's a reference not only to the town of Vicksburg in Mississippi, but also, of course, to the important battle of the Civil War, uh, the Battle of Vicksburg. Uh, to have a conversation today about the battle and about the importance of it, both at the time of the Civil War and subsequently, I'm joined by our friend, Professor Andrew Lang. Um, Andy has been a professor at, of history at Mississippi State University uh, now for several years, and also been participating with Ashbrook in our graduate program, and of course, our Teaching American History seminars for teachers. Uh, Andy got his um, BA and MA from the University of North Texas, and then went on to get an MA and PhD from Rice University in Houston, Texas. He has taught a number of really terrific courses for Ashbrook, grad courses and seminars on um, the coming of the Civil War, on Reconstruction, and on Jacksonian America. So a Andy is, I would, he may be too modest to say this, but I will say it. He is absolutely one of the leading young American scholars on the Civil War and the Civil War era. Uh, he has established himself and his scholarly reputation through his numerous articles and books. Uh, just to highlight a couple of those, in 2017, he published with LSU Press a, a wonderful book entitled In the Wake of War, Military Occupation, Emancipation, and Civil War America. It won the Tom Watson Brown Book Award for Best Book on the Causes, Conduct, and effects of the Civil War. And then uh, his most recent is a book, I think in 2021 with North Carolina Press uh, called A Contest of Civilizations, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism in the Civil War Era. Let me highly recommend that book to our listeners. Go out and buy it. It is an absolutely terrific book. It was a finalist uh, for the 2022 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, one of the most prestigious prizes in American history, and particularly in Civil War studies. So let me again recommend to you all by Andy Lang, A Contest of Civilizations. You will not, um, you will love it. Uh, it. It is absolutely terrific. Andy Lang, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today on The American Idea. Thank you for having me back, Jeff, and thank you especially for the generous introduction. Yeah, I, I should also note, by the way, that the, of course, Mississippi State, in, interesting to me, I think, if unless I'm mistaken, is the repository for the papers of Ulysses Grant. Can, Indeed, that, uh, is that a strange historical accident, Andy? How does that happen? Yeah, it's a, it, as you can imagine, it's a long story, but a a, a positive story, and it, and it's not just the papers; it's the entire U.S. Grant Presidential Library, uh, a state of the art facility uh, on the campus at Mississippi State, um, and incidentally. Um, there's there's funding already approved and in the works to build a state-of-the-art standalone library facility across the street from the university in a few years. How did it happen? Um, the papers of U.S. Grant and the Grant Association were housed for decades at Southern Illinois University. And when the original uh, editor of the papers, John Y. Simon, uh, passed away, um, several leading members of the board of the U.S. Grant Association uh, organized to bring the entire project here to Mississippi State, where one of the leading uh, board members, uh, John Marzalek, uh, took over the editing project and uh, 
was instrumental in um, establishing the library and research center here on campus. Um, and, and when you go there, there's a plaque uh, right outside the uh, front door that says, uh, Grant comes back to Mississippi. And so, uh, uh, which is uh, relevant for our talk today. Absolutely, yeah. And I should note to our listeners, not surprising that Andy was gave the keynote address actually at the 2022 U.S. Grant Bicentennial Commemoration. So we are joined today by a true expert on the Civil War, the conduct of the war, Ulysses Grant. Um, Vicksburg and the Battle of Vicksburg. I think in, in popular in the popular mind and popular memory, it has certainly been overshadowed by the Battle of Gettysburg. So take us back, if you would, to 1863, the Battle of Vicksburg. Some of our listeners will know, but others will not. When did it take place? Where did it take place? And what was the context of the battle? Of course, that's that's the that's the relevant question to start. And I'll 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 begin with a very brief vignette about um how I myself figure into this story. Uh, way back in second grade, I recall uh, having a um, uh, Jeopardy game in my second grade classroom. And my teacher asked a question, what were the two battles that represented the turning point of the American Civil War? And I raised my hand and said, Vicksburg and Gettysburg. Only uh, decades later and in my professional life to entirely repudiate uh, that answer, because in my mind, uh, it is not correct. Um, it certainly exists in the popular imagination that the summer of 1863 represents that grand turning point from which Confederate fortunes declined all the way inevitably to April 9th, 1865 at Appomattox. And I'm, I'm hoping today that one of the things we can do is try to disabuse that popular assumption. So what was going on in the summer of 1863? Why Vicksburg and why is it largely overshadowed by Gettysburg? Vicksburg is far more than a battle. Uh, it is instead a grand campaign that took place from November 1862 until the surrender of Confederate armies on July 4th, 1863, one day after Robert E. Lee was repulsed a thousand miles away at Gettysburg. Military planners on both sides of the battle had been conceiving and thinking about Vicksburg's importance, however, even long before formal campaigning operations began. Um, both Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, and Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States, both recognized Vicksburg's geographic and political symbolism to the war. Davis said Vicksburg is the nail head that holds the South's two halves together. And Lincoln said, see what a lot of land these fellows hold, of which Vicksburg is the key. Let us get Vicksburg and all that country is ours. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. And he was right, because Vicksburg sits at a very important strategic place on the Mississippi River. And by the late uh, autumn of 1862 and into 1863, only Vicksburg and further south, about 180 miles at Port Hudson, Louisiana, um, did the Confederates control that portion of the Mississippi River. The United States controlled everything from the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River on the Gulf all the way up to Port Hudson, and then everything down from Minnesota all the way to Vicksburg. Without control of the Mississippi River, um, the United States uh, therefore could not control highways of invasion um, and split the Confederacy in two. Conversely, Farmers and agriculturalists in the Midwest could not get their grains, their agricultural produce to market without full control of the river. And thus, by the fall of 1862, there was a political dynamic in which President Lincoln was feeling a lot of heat from his constituents in Illinois in particular, um, farmers, agriculturalists, and the like. There's far more to this story, but it takes uh, eight months for the United States finally to claim Vicksburg as their own and open the river. Now, your second question, and I think uh, a, a terribly important question. After everything that I've just laid out, why does this get overshadowed by Gettysburg? I think there are good reasons, and, and a lot of these reasons are somewhat uh, flawed and deal with popular memory and imagination of the Civil War. In hindsight, we know that Gettysburg was by far the largest and bloodiest battle fought in the Civil War 
but also the largest battle ever fought on the North American continent. 165,000 soldiers converged in South Central Pennsylvania in July, 1863. 51,000 casualties in three days of fighting. The end of Robert E. Lee's second invasion of the United States. The site four months later of Lincoln's immortal address at Gettysburg. By far the lar uh, most uh, members, or by far the most attendees, pardon me, of any Civil War battlefield. Three and a half million visitors per year. When you go right to the to the center of the Union line on July 3rd, 1863, there's a placard that says the high water mark of the Confederacy, which means that Confederate fortunes inevitably receded thereafter. And so there's lots of reasons, romantic reasons, to think that Gettysburg is this great turning point that overshadows all else. But I would simply invite our, our um, listeners to ask, what did Gettysburg fundamentally change? in the course of the war when compared to Vicksburg, because I would like to make the case that Vicksburg changed and influenced far more in how the Civil War was waged and how it ultimately figured into the conclusion of the war. But perhaps we can do that in a bit. Yeah, that's a fascinating remark, uh, co perhaps controversial to some of our listeners. I, I wanna take that up. Go back to the context of the Vicksburg uh, battle. It's, uh, as you say, it's part of a larger Western campaign. Remind our listeners what the military situation, where the fortunes of war are in the middle of 1863, particularly in the Western theater. Absolutely. Um, that, that is essential to understanding Vicksburg's importance. Um, I, would, I would submit that we need to go back to the very beginning of the war itself and to General-in-Chief Winfield Scott who in the spring of 1861 formulated what many of our listeners will uh, recognize as the Anaconda Plan. The idea that the United States would surround the borders of the Confederacy with a blockade on the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, capturing the Mississippi River and major uh, water, uh, waterways into the interior of the South, putting forth an imposing presence along the uh, border regions to strangle the Confederacy and compel a largely bloodless surrender uh, of the rebels, perhaps within six months. It turns out that this strategy took much longer than anticipated, and inward invasions, interior invasions of the Confederacy were instead necessary. And we see the beginnings of this in early 1862 with our main character, Ulysses S. Grant, who emerges as one of the foremost military commanders in the Union High Command. With his successful capture of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland and Tennessee Rivers in February 1862, those efforts lead to the uh, collapse of Nashville, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, Corinth, Mississippi, further south, culminating just before Corinth's fall in Grant's third major triumph at Shiloh in the first week of April 1862. And from there, Grant simply keeps moving. The idea is to now move into the Confederate heartland. And Vicksburg is, as President Lincoln said, the key to this. Um, and so by late 1862, there is 100,000 square miles of Confederate territory already occupied by Union forces. Further south on the Mississippi River, New Orleans Falls in April of 1862, the Union Navy moving north up the Mississippi River, ultimately to converge um, with Grant's forces. Compare this great Union, series of great Union triumphs to what is happening in the Eastern Theater, the Virginia Theater, at this same time. The back East, the United States is experiencing nothing but setbacks um, with the Army of the Potomac. And by the summer of 1862, we have the rise of R.E. Lee in Virginia, and a series of Confederate triumphs happening uh, in, in Virginia. And so it, it, it seems uh, almost fortuitous that the ill fortunes in the East, the positive fortunes in the West will converge with Grant's great campaign that begins in November. So then this campaign, of course, as you say, in November leads us toward Vicksburg. 
Um, in the in the days and weeks just prior to July of 1863 in the battle, what is happening such that momentum is moving toward this culminating moment at Vicksburg? Yeah, that's I, I like your use of the word momentum because uh, I, I think Ulysses S. Grant would have a different perspective um, because mu much of the campaign that begins in November and ultimately culminates in Confederate surrender, much of the campaign uh, is failure and setback and frustration on Grant's part. Um, Vicksburg is situated on a very specific and unique place on the Mississippi River. It is it sits atop very high bluffs that overlook the river from which Confederate siege guns can pour down fire on any kind of advance of Union naval forces. To the north of uh, Vicksburg, the Delta and Yazoo swamps create an impenetrable natural barrier from a north-south invasion. So the only way for Grant to get to Vicksburg, ideally, is from the east of the city on firmer, drier land. The question is how to do this. And that's what Grant spends from about November to April trying to figure out, dealing with torrential downpours, malarial disease among his soldiers as they try to dig canals, um, redirect the river, negotiate uh, Confederate cavalry raiders who are harassing Grant's supply line in the rear of his army. Failure after failure after failure this grant meet with to the point that northern uh, newspaper correspondents are screaming for the president to relieve grant of command he's not doing anything and thus um we see actually you now you want to talk about momentum we see the true genius of grant um come through and i i i think it's important to give a quote that really strikes at the heart of what grant is ultimately going to do he said this um, about his philosophy of war. He said, the art of war is simple enough. Find out where your enemy is, get at him as soon as you can, strike at him as hard as you can and as often as you can, and keep moving on. And I think what this illustrates is the, is the Vicksburg campaign in, in motion. Much of the campaign is met with failure, but Grant keeps moving on. He he is like a quarterback who throws four interceptions in the first half, goes to the locker room and says, well, at least we have two more quarters to play. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's terrific because I think of Grant, uh, the, the quarterback, of course, as the strategist on the field of command, adjusting to circumstances. If Grant is bogged down from November until uh, early in the year in 1863, what insight does he have that makes him think, uh, okay, we can actually do this. We can come around to the east of Vicksburg. We can attack on the dry ground. This can work, despite, as you said, I think it will surprise our listeners to realize how much failure Grant had experienced up to that moment uh, in trying to take Vicksburg. What insight did he have that led him to think, okay, we can actually do this? That's a great question. I I'll answer that in part first by saying I, I, I will never take anything away from Ulysses S. Grant, but it did not hurt whom he had as an adversary on the Confederate side. Uh, he, he was blessed to have the enemies that he had in uh, two people by the name of John C. Pemberton, who was commander of the Vicksburg forces um, uh, in the city, and also Joseph E. Johnston, uh, a Confederate general who had about 30,000 soldiers in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, we'll come back to Pemberton and Johnson in a moment, more directly to your question. I think what Grant realized is in those failing months from November to April is that the Confederates were actually lulled into a false sense of security. They had every reason to think that they had withstood attempt after attempt by Grant to get to Vicksburg, but Grant's focus, his aggressiveness, his relentlessness allowed his imagination to ultimately dictate uh, the course of the campaign and take advantage of what he perceived, I think correctly, was the Confederates' false sense of security. So what did he do? Um, by April, after all of this failure, what he, what he does is he orders two of his three corps commanders, uh, two people by the name of John McLaren and 
a political general appointee, a Democrat actually from Illinois, um, and another Corps commander, James B. McPherson, to march their troops on the west side of the Mississippi River, south below Vicksburg in Louisiana, I don't know, about 50 miles below Vicksburg. And Grant will need these two corps ultimately to come across the river and meet Grant on the east side in Mississippi. How does he do this? Well, in a, in a genius coordinator uh, with the United States Navy under the command of uh, Flag Officer David Dixon Porter, on the nights of uh, April 16th and 17th, uh, it, was a, it was a foggy night, a, a very cloudy night. Dixon and his, I don't know, 10 to 12 ironclads and transports ran the batteries at Vicksburg um, in a, in a, in a two-hour bombardment, which, which observers say lit the, lit the sky ablaze as if the sun was shining. And it was, it was magnificent, near almost providential, because all but one of, of Dixon's ironclads and transports got below the Vicksburg defenses and met Grant 50 miles south of the city. And it is from there, it is from there that Grant's genius uh, really begins to show for what happens next. So what does happen next? What does happen? All right, this is where the campaign really transforms itself. And it is from here that I really think that we begin to see Vicksburg as an example of much bigger changes happening in the American Civil War at this moment. Transformative fundamental changes. What happens? When Grant goes below Vicksburg, he now uh, uh, fosters great confusion in the minds of Pemberton and Vicksburg and Johnston and uh, Jackson. Where's Grant going to go? Well, it just makes sense that he would just march straight north to Vicksburg. That's his goal. But he didn't. He, of course, moved directly northeast to Jackson. Why? So that he could keep both halves of the Confederate Army split and unable to unite. Grant's idea is simple. We're gonna cut our supply bases below Vicksburg and we're gonna live off the land. We're going to forage, we're going to confiscate property, we're going to destroy uh, property that could be used by Confederates to fuel the war effort. Uh, the property of loyal citizens will be left alone, but this is a war and it is not simply a war against armies, and it's not simply a war against um, locales. It is a war against um, a popular will. And thus the whole intention beginning right here is to dismantle the entire war making ability and rebellious ability of the Confederacy. Well, and that's, that's what fascinating. So that's fascinating. Is that new thinking by Grant? Because I'm thinking, for example, of Sherman's march to the sea through Georgia, obviously that's on a much larger scale in many respects and perhaps more ferocious. Um, but is this new thinking by Grant, let's make war against the war-making ability of the entire population? It's a great question. Um, by this point in the war, Grant is, is practicing a kind of warfare that's not unique. Uh, military commanders prior to him have experimented with this but it is really gonna take on a life of its own by 1863, all the way through the end of the war. But there, there, there's a great crisis in the Union high command about the kind of war needs to be waged. If you talk to George B. McClellan, no, this is a very um, restrained, limited, conditional war in which the capture of Richmond, Virginia is the only objective. No, if you talk to President Lincoln, you talk to General Grant, and on the opposite side, you talk to Robert E. Lee, and they would say, no, the center of gravity in this conflict is the enemy's ability and will to make war. And there's a great quote from Grant in his memoirs uh, where he reflects on this. He goes back to Shiloh in April of 1862 uh, in his memory, and he says, up to the Battle of Shiloh, I, as well as thousands of other citizens, believed that the rebellion against the government would collapse suddenly and soon, if a decisive victory could be gained over any of its armies. But I gave up all idea after Shiloh of saving the Union except by complete conflict. Hmm. Everything rebellious has to be dismantled. 
And that's what that's what the Vicksburg campaign at this point shows. And right after Vicksburg is captured, William Tecumseh Sherman will start experimenting with this kind of warfare um, on an expedition to Meridian, Mississippi, in which he dismantles rail lines, telegraph lines, confiscates property, liberates enslaved people, all in a demonstration that we, the United States, uh, have authority, legitimate authority, and your government, the Confederate government, cannot protect you. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. I'm Dr. John Moser, professor of history at Ashland University and chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. The MAG program is for teachers who want to master their craft by building content knowledge from original documents, from the words of those who lived and shaped our history, and not from textbooks or lectures. Our program is built around the discussion of original sources, and our faculty, both from both Ashland University and from across the country, is committed to this approach. We believe that the best way to get to know our past is to have a conversation with those who were there. James Madison, Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Theodore Roosevelt, and so many more. We offer two programs for working teachers and a broad selection of core and elective courses. You can learn more at tah.org slash programs. All right. So after this really brilliant, this change in strategy or this implementation of this strategy and the brilliant move northeast to cut the Confederate forces in two, what happens next? Yes. So uh, when Grant uh, begins his uh, campaign uh, to Jackson on May 1st, all the way to May 18th, he will fight five battles uh, at Port Gibson, Raymond, uh, Jackson, Champion Hill and the Big Black River on his move to Vicksburg. And in all five engagements, he will defeat Confederate forces. He will capture the city of Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, and isolate Joseph Johnston's army northeast of the city. Johnson will never be able to meet up uh, with John C. Pemberton. We could talk about the crisis in the Confederate high command. It's a mess. There's a reason they don't unite, but I won't get sidetracked. Um, but once Grant then turns west to the 40 to 45 miles to Vicksburg, he pushes Pemberton's forces back into the city. And on May 19th and May 22nd, 1863, Grant authorizes two massive frontal assaults against Confederate defensive works that had been built and really perfected over the last uh, year, year and a half. By this point, Vicksburg is the second most fortified city in the Confederacy uh, second only to Richmond. And so this is this is no laughing matter. And on both occasions, on the 19th and 22nd, Grant is repulsed handily and bloodily. Uh, and he, he, he thereafter calls off those uh, assaults any further and settles for a siege. Um, a siege during the American Civil War, almost invariably, perhaps even inevitably, works to the advantage of that army besieging the enemy. And for the next 47 days, from May 23rd, I believe, until July 4th, uh, Grant besieged the Confederacy, uh, uh, besieged the Confederates in Vicksburg, and ultimately compelled the surrender. Was there, were there attempts as the siege sets in? Um, first of all, how many troops does Grant have there with him at Vicksburg, and how many do the Confederates have in the city? Great question. I should have mentioned that earlier. Grant, by this point, Grant has about 72,000 uh, Union troops with him, uh, organized into three corps. I've already mentioned two of the corps commanders, John McLaren, uh, James B. McPherson, and his foremost subordinate, William Tecumseh Sherman. John C. Pemberton has under his command in the city at this point about 30,000. Okay. What? So yeah. Yeah, so we've got 70,000 or so against 30,000 or so. The first attacks are repulsed. As you say, the siege then sits in. He realizes we can't take this city in a frontal assault. We've tried twice. Do the Confederates make any attempt to relieve the troops there in Vicksburg or try in some way to break through the siege? Yeah, this is, this is one of those moments where the Confederates would have been... Uh, uh, 
greatly benefited to have somebody else in the vicinity other than uh, Joseph E. Johnson. Johnson is still sitting there just northeast of Jackson, and he does very little uh, to, to assist in relief efforts. It probably oh. would have been futile anyway. Why? Our listeners will want to know why. <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, that, that's one of the perennial questions. Um, I, I, I have to hold my, my uh, contempt for Johnston in check here. Um, it, it is maddening. Johnston, Johnston is hardly an aggressive commander. Uh, he's cautious. He's defensive. Um, there is not a day that goes by that Johnston doesn't think this is an ideal day to delay and retreat. Uh, you also, you, you, so you have a personality uh, uh, thing happening here. Plus, he and Pemberton did not get along. That's not the reason why Johnson didn't didn't help. But there, there's there's some there's some competitiveness there. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that in Johnston's defense, there's also prudence. Um, there is no way that his force of 30,000 men himself is going to do anything to harass uh, Grant's force of 70,000 to any meaningful effect. And so Pemberton is left largely alone. And if you think about where Vicksburg is situated, there's a natural barrier behind Pemberton, which is the Mississippi River, on which is now being uh, regulated by the Union Navy. Just to Pemberton's immediate east, is the Union siege line engulfing the city, increasingly, slowly inching closer and closer toward the city as those 47 days transpire. And so it's only a matter of time. Grant knew this. Uh, he, he wrote to Washington on May 24th, um, I think the second day the siege began, and he said the fall of Vicksburg and the capture of most of the garrison can only now be a question of time. And he was right. Um, civilians fled the city um, and, and dug uh, caves and dugouts in the hillsides uh, behind the city to withstand the uh, naval bombardments that happened 24 hours a day. Scurvy and other maladies tore through the camps, tore through the army towards civilian populations. Everyone, civilian soldier alike, is reduced to eating dogs, cats, mules, even rats. Um, the soldiers under Pemberton's command by the end of June threatened to mutiny, and that's when Pemberton sends commissioners through a line of truce to uh, seek negotiations with Grant. What is the result of those negotiations? Absolutely. Grant has a problem on his hands. Grant could request the unconditional surrender of the entire Vicksburg garrison. But that would mean that Grant would now have to feed, house, clothe, and take care of 30,000 Confederate prisoners. There is simply not the infrastructure to do this. So what Grant does is he says, I, I demand a conditional surrender, meaning that you, Pemberton, and your men will be paroled, which means that the Confederate soldiers would sign papers and attest not to re-enter Confederate service until they themselves are exchanged at a later date for paroled Union soldiers. So this relieves Grant the responsibility of taking care of 30,000 Confederates while also signaling a way in which to get uh, 30,000 Union soldiers who are prisoners of war uh, back in exchange. Well, that's fascinating uh, because to my mind, I mean, U.S. Grant, he's known in, during the war as unconditional surrender grant, <laughs> but here he does not act on that and gives conditional surrender. What, if I can ask, is the response in either the Union Army or in the in the North uh, opinion when this is known? Absolutely. I mean, the, the formal surrender happens at 10 o'clock in the morning on July 4th, 1863, uh, the symbol of which did not go unnoticed at all then and now. Um, jubilation, celebration within the Union lines, certainly celebration uh, in the United States uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, the great uh, historian uh, James uh, M. McPherson wrote that that July 4th of uh, 1863 was the most memorable since the one four score and seven years previously. Um, and he's right. Uh, this, is, this is remarkable news to a Northern home front that is desperate for good news. And this is coming on the heels again, one day after Lee's repulse at Gettysburg, all of a sudden, it seems that Union fortunes 
um, have now have now turned around and unequivocally, unquestionably they had. But now I think would be a good time to turn to what exactly did Vicksburg do? Yeah, what about the effects of the battle? The, the military effects, the political effects, the social effects? Um, you said it was incredibly important. What about it as an, its effect on the course of the war? Of course, uh, there, there's, there's several key areas to focus on. Um, the first I think that we should deal with uh, Grant. There's little question now that by the summer of 1863, Ulysses S. Grant has emerged as the unquestioned foremost military commander in the United States. Um, Lincoln said that he is my man and I am his for the duration. Uh, several months later, Lincoln will transplant Grant to Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, relieve a siege at Chattanooga, capture that really important railroad town, which is the jumping off point in early 1864 for Sherman's march into Atlanta. Early in 1864, Grant will then go east officially and receive his commission uh, as a three-star general, four-star, three, uh, I can't remember, three or four-star general, the only rank, lieutenant general is the rank, the only rank previously held by George Washington. Uh, and it is from there that Grant will uh, spend the next year combating Lee. But why does Grant achieve this great reputation? It's his dispassion, his aggressiveness, his pragmatic, prudent approach to war, his, his reluctance to whine and yell and retreat and plead to Washington for more help when things don't go his way. Uh, and it works. Uh, it works out splendidly for him. Uh, what about the strategic picture? Well, the Trans-Mississippi Theater, which uh, is considered those Confederate states west of the Mississippi, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, now cut off from the rest of the Confederacy. This is significant. We have Arkansas cotton, Louisiana sugar, Texas beef that can no longer be easily transported to supply Confederate armies back east. There is also, therefore, an unquestioned uh, symbolic morale collapse about what this exactly means to the Confederacy. Their nation geographically, in a sense, is no longer whole. Um, for the United States, the United States now controls the entirety of the Mississippi River from Minnesota to the Gulf, five days after Vicksburg surrendered. That other fort I mentioned uh, in Louisiana, Fort Hudson. Fort Hudson surrenders to uh, a general by the name of uh, Nathaniel Banks on July 9th, 1863, and the river's open. There's even further significance than this. Right around this time, uh, in, the, in the summer of 1863, President Lincoln dispatches to the Mississippi Valley um, an adjutant general, or a, a brigadier general by the name of Lorenzo Thomas uh, to go to the Mississippi Valley and begin raising regiments of formerly enslaved men, African-American men, into United States service. The president had been given authorization via Congress through the Militia Act of 1862, and Lincoln had then written this into the Emancipation Proclamation to raise Black soldiers. And with Vicksburg open and the Union controlling the heart, the heart of the slaveholding South, Thomas's efforts pay off to the point that nearly 40% of the entire number of African American soldiers uh, resulted from Thomas's labor. And they're all located right here. Um, this is a massive revolutionary transformation. This Vicksburg is, is, is at the heart of the largest slaveholding region in the entire world. And now in two years time, it has been so upended that formerly enslaved men are now wearing the uniform of the very nation that once consigned their enslavement. And what are they doing? They're occupying Vicksburg itself. They're occupying other Southern towns. They're conducting raids and confiscation expeditions on uh, plantations, liberating slaves, destroying Confederate infrastructure, this is remarkable. And these numbers of men are only going to grow. Grant said, by arming the Negro, we have added a powerful ally 
they will make good soldiers and taking them from the enemy weakens him in the same proportion as they strengthen us. And then finally, we talked about new ways in which the United States is conducting war. Yes, Grant conducted a very traditional campaign, joint army, Navy operations, sieges, formal campaigns, but it is through his recognition that Vicksburg had to be captured as a material and symbolic sign that the Confederacy is too weak to maintain its own territorial integrity and cannot maintain its own military infrastructure. And from here, this logic is only going to grow. Sherman learns the exact same things. As I mentioned, in the wake of Vicksburg, he's going to conduct um, experimental campaigns of the like that he will unfold the next year in his march to Atlanta, and then his more famous march from Atlanta to Savannah and up through the Carolinas. It is now a war against the entire Confederate foundation, the Confederate will to resist, um, and as a sign that United States federal authority is legitimate. What, um, man, that, that is so, now you're revealing this is so deeply significant, the importance of Vicksburg, um, not just the battle itself and the immediate military situation, but the larger entire course of the war. I wonder in, in your studies of this, what lessons, what are to your mind is the most important lesson or insight you gain from this campaign and in particular Vicksburg? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think there are many, but I wanna, I wanna focus on two that may not be as obvious. We can study the, the military campaign and strategy for what it is, and I think we should. Incidentally, I lead a staff ride of Vicksburg every year for the Mississippi State ROTC uh, cadets who, who require a staff ride for commissioning. So we do all of that, strategy, tactics, lessons, et cetera. But I wanna focus on two other areas. One, the way in which we started, how we think about and remember Gettysburg, Vicksburg, the summer of 1863, and the myths of the Civil War. You know, for, for decades, uh, Grant suffered a terrible reputation among historians and popular writers that largely grew out of and was conditioned by the Confederate lost cause. Um, the lost cause narrative that painted Grant as a bumbling, drunk butcher who was so callous and uncaring and uh, dispassion of his own men that he just fed them through the meat grinder with little care. In comparison to the more genteel, refined, but always on the defensive, Robert E. Lee. Well, as, as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. And I, I want to point us to just how false this lost cause narrative is. Let me give you some numbers. From Grant's first engagement in 1861 at a, at a little battle called Belmont, Missouri, all the way through his taking command of all United States Army forces in 1864. And we're talking Belmont, Henry and Donaldson, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga. And that entire time, Grant suffered 35,000 casualties. During the entire Vicksburg campaign, he suffered 10,000 casualties. Now, during this exact same time, Robert E. Lee suffered 90,000 casualties. Why? Because of Lee's aggressive way of war. It's the kind of war he advertised. It's the kind of war he waged. Grant was not going to bleed his army dry. He just wasn't. Um, the Overland Campaign of 1864 between Grant and Lee was remarkably bloody. That's not the subject of today's talk. But my point is, is that Grant was very keen on the lives of his men. He did not view them as mere cogs in a faceless, heartless military machine. Grant also had a strategic uh, understanding and assumption of just what exactly the American Civil War was. It was a war between peoples, nations, ideas, in which there was a right side and a wrong side. And that means something but it was also a war waged for national unification. And a war for union, just as President Lincoln understood, could never necessitate the heartless bloodletting 
the callous bloodletting of both his own soldiers and the Southern populace. Rather, it was to dismantle the institutions and the ideology underpinning the rebellion itself. The second thing that I would take away from Vicksburg is the way President Lincoln himself reacted to the battle in two ways. Right after, about a week later, Lincoln sends Grant a letter. And, and we read in this very brief letter Lincoln's humility uh, for when he's wrong. And do me the justice of, of reading very quickly from this. He says, my dear general, I do not remember that you and I have ever met personally. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgement for the almost inestimable service you have done the country. But I wish to say a word further. When you first reached the vicinity of Vicksburg, I thought you should do what you finally did. March the troops across the neck, run the batteries with the transports and thus go below. And I never had any faith, except a general hope that you knew better than I, that the Yazoo Pass expedition and the like could succeed. When you got below and took Fort, Gut, Fort Gibson, Grand Gulf in the vicinity, I thought you should go down the river and join General Banks. And when you did turn northward east of the Big Black River, I feared it was a mistake. I now wish to make the personal acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. Um, words that we don't get from any president of any party anymore. Um, let's compare this with another letter that Lincoln wrote at the exact same moment to his commander in the East, the uh, hero of Gettysburg, George Gordon Lee. I won't read from that letter, but the, up, the uptake is Lincoln read Meade the riot act. How could you let Lee escape? How could you not follow him to the Potomac River? How could you not chase him across the Potomac River? He was in your grasp. The end of the war was in grasp. What are you thinking? On the one hand, Lincoln's not wrong. But Lincoln had the uh, uh, foresight of mind to put that letter in his desk and not send it. Why? Lincoln was not there and Meade was. Meade was terribly bloodied and bruised after Gettysburg, just as was Lee. It was a very difficult proposition for Meade to pursue Lee in that fashion and in the war um, in such, a, such an easy way. And I think that we see Lincoln in the fullest sense of his restraint, his humility, his ability to see complex situations. It is a, it is a lesson, um, I believe, uh, for the commander in chief in general. Amazing. Um, very moving, very powerful. I mean, our listeners, we need to reacquaint ourselves, obviously, with this incredibly important moment in American history. Andy, for our listeners, what are some books or movies or TV shows that you would recommend for those who want to understand more fully um, the Battle of Vicksburg, the Western Campaign, Ulysses Grant? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the best campaign books written on the Vicksburg campaign is by Michael Bally. Um, the name of the book now escapes me. I, I'm, I'm put on the spot. But if you if you if you Amazon or Google search Michael Ballard Vicksburg campaign, it'll come right up. It was published about 15 years ago by University of North Carolina Press. It covers the entirety of the campaign in the most readable way, uh, from the very early moments to the aftermath of the surrender, without ever delving too deeply into the nitty gritty, minute operations of of military events. Uh, for Grant, oh, there's a there, there's such a wonderful literature on Grant. Uh, my favorite book on Grant is by uh, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Joan Waugh, W A U G H. It's called uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, American Hero, American Myth, and it deals with exactly that uh, the the rehabilitation of Grant's image historically, but also how Grant has been remembered through time, both as a military commander and as a uh, president. In terms of the Western theater, um, I should I should know this. Um, there's a there's a great a great book on um, uh, the Army of Tennessee, the Confederate Army in the broader Western theater that really captures uh, the Western theater as a whole. It's called Conquered by Larry Daniel. It's a it's it, it's a really shrewd and powerful book, a corrective uh, in the literature on the Western theater. Um, 
And how about any movies or or TV shows or anything for our listeners who would be interested in? Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, so so we do have a problem because um, there's there, there, there's not a corollary to the great 1993 Gettysburg movie called Vicksburg. So we don't have that. But what we do have, I failed to mention this earlier, in 1959. Uh, there was a, a great John Wayne movie called The Horse Soldiers, and that has a direct connection to the Vicksburg campaign. When Grant was marching uh, northeast from the Mississippi River to Jackson, he authorized a massive cavalry raid under the command of a person named Benjamin Grierson to leave LaGrange, Tennessee in western Tennessee and, and ride through eastern Mississippi and all the way down to Baton Rouge as a way to uh, deflect Confederate cavalry into following them. It was the largest cavalry raid of the entire war. And it is that on which the horse soldiers in 1959 uh, was based. Remarkably romanticized as you would imagine, but uh, still a lot of fun. Yeah, terrific. And let me add for our listeners, a reminder of Andy's most recent book, A Contest of Civilizations, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism in the Civil War era. Let me heartily recommend that to our listeners as well. What a terrific conversation, wetting our appetites to dig more deeply, Andy, into this enormously important time in American history. Thank you so much for joining us today on The American Idea. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, Remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.